Uh, good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time at Broken Bay. I might just put that up there so that you're not hearing p -p -p all the time. Um, I, something that was left off is that Frank was my teacher. <laughs> Uh, and doctoral supervisor, so uh, not that we always agreed, but uh, I owe a great debt to, to Frank for his teaching, his inspiration really, uh, that led me to do my own work in the Gospel of John. So it's a joy to be here working with him, working with you. I want to pick up some of the things that Frank said. Um, he talked about it being an old story told in a new way. Okay? Oops, I'm not Madonna, see? Mine keeps falling off. <laughs> in case anyone thought I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the questions that all the writers in the New Testament faced was who is Jesus? And what was God doing in his life and death and rising? Where was God in Jesus of Nazareth? <coughs> now every gospel writer, every uh, oh, letter writer had to answer that question in different ways depending on the audience. So here in New South Wales, if I want to uh, make comparisons, I might have to talk about rugby, about which I know nothing. Whereas in Victoria, I'd talk about AFL, real football. <laughs> so it depends where you are and who your audience is as to the emphasis you're going to give. Okay? So all the gospel writers are going to tell the Jesus story with a different emphasis, perhaps from a different angle. If you like, you could imagine that there were four cameras set up and each camera is taking it from a slightly different perspective. So that's the first thing. Another thing in asking the question, where was God and what was God doing? A handy way to find an answer is to look back and see what was God doing in the past or where was God in your past experience. I do that all the time. If you're in any sort of spiritual uh, quest or, or serious about spiritual questions, you have a new experience and you might start pondering, what's God saying to me in this? And one way of thinking about it is to look back and see, well, how has God operated in my life in the past? And if you happen to be a community, you look back at how have we found God in the past? Because if this is a new God experience, there will be continuity. There will be change, it will have new words perhaps, but it will be continuous with the God you already know. And so all the Gospel writers are going to look back, of course, to the story of Israel, to the way they, God acted in their past, to the God they discovered in their community's history. Now sometimes, and here I'll get you to open your text. All got your Bibles? Okay, open up at John chapter 1, verse 23. Okay, John 1, 23. And my Bible, very helpfully, has got it indented uh, it's got inverted commas and that's a way that the, the editors have highlighted this little text. This is all it says. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Now that's very handy. We're told this is a direct quotation from Isaiah. That's good. 
So there are going to be times when John's Gospel will have direct citations. And they'll be very clear in the text, like that one. But there's a lot of other times when it's not so direct. So have a look now at John 1, verse 1. And it says, in the beginning. Now it doesn't say, as <laughs> it doesn't tell us where this phrase comes from, because it expects us all to know it. Hopefully you do know it. It comes from Genesis, right. And of course, if you're a first century Jew, of course you know it. You recognize it immediately. Now this is called an allusion. My students sometimes call it an illusion, but it's an allusion. Now John's going to do that a lot. Simply going to expect that you know the Old Testament very well. And for Catholics, that's a problem. Because we don't. Sometimes when I'd lecture overseas, I'd have some in the group knowing it immediately and I'd go up to them and say, you're all Protestant, aren't you? They'd say, yeah, mm -hmm. we're Lutheran. Uh, because we're not familiar with our Old Testament enough. So sometimes uh, Frank and I will have to say, this is really taking us back to the book of Exodus or to an image or something like that. So allusions are important. Here's an example. If I say, go ahead, make my day. Make my day. It's an allusion. What's the film? Oh, something with <laughs> Dirty <laughs> Harry. All right. Or if I say, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Allusions. <laughs> and just saying that much you can almost see Scarlet and Rhett Butler on that carriage driving through Atlanta. The whole thing is before you. Now, that's how the Gospel writers work. They expect you to pick up the clues. And from just a small phrase, to have the whole episode there. And this, of course, is a big problem uh, for uh, uh, Catholics and other groups who aren't familiar with the Old Testament but it keeps Frank and I in a job because it's our job to point these things out to you. So as often you'll hear, hear me say now this is an allusion to uh, keep thinking that the original audience as Frank said the original community uh, were Jews. The original believers were Jews. This gospel developed in Jerusalem. This is a gospel that knows the geography of Jerusalem. It knows about the pool of Bethesda. It knows about the Sheep Gate. It knows the porticos of Solomon and the pool of Siloam. The other gospels don't mention these things. But this gospel does because this is someone who has walked the streets of Jerusalem knows it very well. The other thing too is that even when the community moves out of the land of Israel and over, and I agree with Frank that it's probably in Ephesus, we know from the way Paul wrote that, or in, in the Acts of the Apostles too, that even when the Gentiles became believers, many of those Gentiles were hangers-on to Judaism. They were there in the synagogue. In the Acts of the Apostles, they're called the God-fearers. They never fully converted to Judaism, but they were attracted to it. Attracted to its morals, its family life, its ancient traditions. So even while we move out of a strictly Jewish milieu, we're still attracting Gentiles who have been attracted to Judaism. And that's why we can understand that there are so many illusions. They don't have to have somebody saying, what's he talking about? 
And I, I don't get it. Okay, so that's a, a couple of points from the what, what way Frank uh, spoke this morning, that it is telling an old story. You know, that old story of the way God had acted through the people of Israel is now being told again uh, for this Christian community. Okay, so I want you to look at page 24 of your book, right? Not the Bible, that. <laughs> Okay. Now up the top, I just want to point out, I do have a home page, and you can see it there. At the bottom of the home page are seven little video clips on the Gospel of John, freely available. Okay, they're on YouTube. Each one's about ten minutes. So when you go home, uh, if you want to, uh, you can use those. Right? They're there. Now, there are many ways of looking at how John might have planned this wonderful introduction to his gospel called the prologue. A way that I found helpful that makes sense to me is what you see before you, where it's set out in basically two parallel columns. Now, this is not the only way, right? It's important to know that. But it's a way I found helpful. Now why did I do it like that? Is I noticed that from verse 14 on, all the pronouns that are used are first person. That is, if you have a look in verse 14, us, us, and then we saw his glory. And then when John witnesses, we get John's own voice. So John can say, I said, after me, came before me. And then in the next little block from his fullness, we have all received. So that gives this part of the prologue, the character of being witnessing, first person testimony. So that's why I've headed it. Headed it uh, testimony and the first part is to reported speech no first person pronouns it begins with an allusion to Genesis in the beginning the word was with God God was the word or what God was the word was in the beginning with God then the very first thing, and if you're remembering Genesis, on Genesis day one, God creates light, separates light from darkness. Remember that? Yep. Day one. Now if you look here, uh, where I've got seen, we've got something similar happening. Everything came into being through him, without him came nothing, in him was life, and the life was the light. <laughs> light. And we begin to get an opposition named. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. It's, it's just naming it. As the gospel progresses, we'll see people who make choices to live within the darkness. And we'll see other people who make choices to move out of the dark towards the light. But here we're getting the beginning of this naming of light and darkness, similar to what we have in Genesis 1. Then we get the witness of John, and if you have a look uh, under the story section, it's made very clear that John was not the light. John was not the light. He came as a witness, a witness to the light. If there's time, we might talk a little bit more about John's role as witness. Uh, I've written about it as based on marriage customs. Marriage customs, where a witness is needed mm -hmm, in a marriage custom. More on that a bit later. But John's role here as one who gives testimony, one who witnesses. Then we get to 
two different responses to the word. So we get the light coming into the world. Verse 11 I want you to take notice of. He came to his own. Now I'm going to write some Greek on the board and I'm going to suggest you write it down too because it's a very important phrase that is going to occur right at the end of the Gospel and when it occurs again it gets translated terribly. So I want you to remember verse 11 here. He came to his own. This is what it looks like in Greek. Ace Idia. It will turn up again. Okay, a star idia. It's a little idiom. It's a bit hard to translate it. Often um, your Bible probably says, if you have a look at what your text says, it probably says he came to his own people or came to what was his own. And his own okay, or sometimes it says he came to his own home. Okay, they add words to try and help you make sense. It should simply say he came to his own, his own did not receive him. Now that's one choice. One choice is not to receive him. And there is another choice. Let's look at it. Those who did receive him he gave them the power to become the children of God. That's where this gospel is heading. So just remember verse 11 and 12. Somehow the narrative is going to have to show that. That disciples, those who believe, become children. And then it just says, these people are born, not of blood, not of the will of man, but born of God. Mm -hmm. So that's the story. The word from the beginning, coming into the world, two possible choices. Two possible choices. Then we start telling the story again, but from the position of a witness. First person testimony. And now we're told, the Word became flesh. And look at what your Bible has. Look at what your Bible has. You, you got lived among us? Has anyone got? Yes. Lived among us? Okay. Now, the actual Greek word that's used here is a bit more Greek for you. Sorry, we have to keep doing this. Is the word that was used to describe the tabernacle in the Old Testament. So that's why I've got on your page, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Now that's an allusion. It's taking us back to the whole story of God wanting to dwell with the people of Israel. John could have simply said the word became flesh and lived among us or remained among us but he chose a word related to the great tabernacle. Hope you remember that story that after the wonderful experience of encountering God on Mount Sinai the people wanted God to, st oh well first of all they wanted to stay there and then of course they want God to, st to be with them. Now being human, you and I, we need symbols. We want to know God really is with us. So this hasn't got wheels, is it? Uh, but can I just use that for a second? They built a box, right? they called it the ark. And then over it they put a tent and then they carried this with them. So that even when they moved from the mountain, they had the sense of God travelling with them. Like that. Now they didn't think God was in here. Hope I don't knock everything around. Whoops, you do, I am. Um, put that back up there again. I think it's because I've got glasses keeps falling off. I, I, they don't think God's in here. 
right? They know that's impossible. But the ark is the great symbol, the reminder of the presence of God with them. Okay? So, thank you very much. In saying, introducing the word became flesh and tabernacled, this gospel is saying that's who Jesus is. The presence of God in our midst, travelling with us. So it's a wonderful image that translations miss if they just say lived. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, we then get, we saw his glory, yeah, associated again with the great revelation of God's glory on Mount Sinai. I'll come back to the end of verse 14 in just a sec because I've translated it differently to the way your Bibles have. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. We get the witness of John. Then we get verse 16. From his fullness we have all received. Now, uh, rubble that off. Whoops, no, that one. That's better. Now I've got to rub it all off. Mm. That's better. Good. Magic. Okay. Your text probably has grace upon grace. Have you got that? Okay. It's wrong. <laughs> all right. It's wrong. I'm sorry about that, but it's, it's still wrong. <laughs> this is what the word looks like. Oops, got to do that again. Charis. Okay, some of you here are religious. It's like the word charism. Okay, or you talk about footballers, basketballers as charismatic. In other words, people who are gifted. So the basic word for meaning of this word is the word gift. <coughs> then we've got it used again. Okay, but still, kara, so it gift, one's, whoopsie do, don't know how I did that. Whoops, get rid of it. Pardon? Tip on the board anywhere. There we go. It's a, a gift. And in the middle, it's got this word. Now, if you see the word anti, doesn't it usually have the sense of against or over against something? So it's not grace upon grace. It's got nothing to do with upon. It's a gift instead of another gift. That's what it's about. A gift instead of a gift. And if we keep reading, we're told what these two gifts are. Let's have a look at it. For the law. There's your first gift. And it is a gift. God's gift to the Jewish people. A whole way of life. Torah. That's your first gift. The law was given through Moses. And then it says, but the true gift. See, I keep on wanting to translate Charis as gift not grace. The true gift came through Jesus. So we're getting a comparison made between Moses and Jesus. Between the great gift of the law and some other gift that Jesus is going to give. And we already know what that is because we've read verse 11 and 12. The gift to become the children of God. <coughs> Those who believed in his name, he gave them the power to become the children of God. So the prologue is setting up this contrast and remembering what Frank said before, that this is a community in a situation at the end of the first century, struggling with their identity over and against a Judaism that is now 
not wanting them part of the synagogue, at least in wherever John's writing. So this is a, a conflict going on. Because after the year 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed, Judaism is nearly destroyed. No priests, no temple, okay? no sacrifice. How, how are the Jewish people going to find their identity? So the teachers, the rabbis emerge to say, we have the law. That's, how, that's what will now shape and focus our life. No longer priests, no long, longer temple, no longer sacrifice. The law. And we have another group of Jews who are saying, mm, our belief in Jesus is that he's the Messiah. And so they're moving away from the law of Moses to faith in Jesus. So we're getting this contrast, and the prologue is naming it. So if we have a look again, have a look back at verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That's one response. And the tragedy is that because of faith in the law of Moses, and we'll see this in the, as the Gospel goes on, the very law of Moses proves to be the obstacle to why they can't come to see Jesus as the one. But those who did receive him, he gave power to become the children of God. Our two gifts in the parallel section, it's named like that. So, let's read verse 16 again. From his fullness we have all received a gift instead of a gift. For the law was given through Moses, but the true gift came through Jesus Christ. So translating it as gift, which is <laughs> a meaning of charism, makes much more sense. Then we have a conclusion, no one has ever seen God the only Son, close to the Father's heart, in the bosom of the Father, close to the Father's heart, that one has made him known. Now, one of the things you do when you're a teacher, as Frank would know too, is not only do you teach what you're good at, but you get to teach what you're not good at too. And at one time I was teaching uh, undergraduates introduction to the Old Testament, and I was teaching them the book of Genesis. Oops, wrong thing again. I have to keep remembering I've got to use the blackboard eraser. Yeah. If I want to get rid of everything. Let's see if that did it. Good. Okay, so we were looking at the book of Genesis. So you have a look back too, just very quickly. And it begins, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Right. There was darkness over the face of the deep. You've got those three opening verses that form an introduction. Okay. Good. Then we've got day one. What happens on day one? Have a look. We've got light and dark and what happens to them? They're separated. So we get light and dark separated. So that's day one. Good. Separation. What happens on day two? Another act of separation. Waters, whereabouts are they? Waters above from the waters below. So you get the creation of the great dome to separate waters above from the waters below. Okay, what happens on day three? What's separated? The land and the sea. The great the water and the land. Okay, so water and land. Okay, three acts of separation begin. It's really creating order out of chaos. Isn't that what you do? Out of the you take the washing, 
You're bringing the washing in. It's a great big pile. Isn't the first thing you do create order out of chaos by separating? <laughs> Tea towels. Here, underwear. Okay? Uh, men in it in their, you know, their sheds at the back. N nails. Alright? Um, what else? Uh, hammers. You separate. You separate. Order out of chaos. That's great. Now the next thing is we have to populate. So we fill up. The light is populated. So have a look at day four. And God makes the, the great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And the stars. So now we're filling in, we're populating what was created here. So the light now, the sun, Genesis won't name that because it was a god. It was thought to be a god. So it doesn't even name it. Now, look at day five. So this is day four. Day five. Look at day five. And what gets created up above? The birds, yes. And in the waters below, the fish. I hope you can see See, these are the waters above, and now up above we get it filled in by birds, down below filled in by fish. Okay, then day six, we get God creating the great <coughs> land creatures. Have a look, because now we've got the land. So now we have the creation of the animals, and including in that uh, the humans, male and female. Okay, that's how it works. That's how it's structured. And then finally, just so we don't get too full of ourselves, um, that we're not the pinnacle of God's creation. We're only day six. The pinnacle, the peak, comes on day seven. And what happens on God day seven? Rest. Day of rest. God says, it is finished. Or when God finished the work. We get the great rest. Oh, I've got five minutes. Right. So we get the great Sabbath. Because God has finished. And then we get a conclusion. Now, if you have a look down the bottom of your page... I think you can see John's prologue looks very like the structure of the first chapter of Genesis or the first creation story. Can you see that? Yeah. <coughs> Except for one thing. What's not there in the prologue? Yeah, the Sabbath, right. So in John, John's theology is that creation was not finished in the beginning. <coughs> we even have Jesus saying, and just underneath that block, we have a saying in John chapter 5, 17, My Father is still working, and so am I. So John's theology is not that creation got finished in the beginning, but that it's been ongoing. And it's not until the cross when Jesus says, it is finished. Same words of Genesis. That we get this announcement that this act of creation has now been brought to its conclusion. That's leaping ahead, but just to show you the way the prologue makes allusions to the Old Testament scriptures makes allusions to the tabernacle to say that's who Jesus is. It makes allusions to uh, the book of Genesis to say that one of the themes in this gospel is going to be life. Life. Okay? Creation. One of the themes. Okay? Uh, I think we will finish there. I've got another two minutes but on the next page 
are a number of other Old Testament themes that John also is picking up. A very big one is the theme of divine wisdom. Wisdom who is present with God in creation and in the middle one you can see from the book of Sirach in the dark type how wisdom was looking for a dwelling place. Among all these I sought a dwelling place. Then the creator of all things gave me a commandment and assigned me a place for my tent. That's that skene word again, tabernacle. Make your dwelling in Jacob. So even in the Old Testament, God is wanting to dwell with God's people. And in John's Gospel, John says, that's right. And that's who Jesus is. The presence of God dwelling in our midst. And that's only in the prologue. And we've read that, so we've got to hold that in mind as now we move into the narrative to see, are people going to understand that or not? And now Frank's going to pick, us, pick that up a little bit further.